This is lecture 3.4 for statistics, and this lecture has quite a bit of information in it, so um, I'm going to do a couple of problems from the homework during this lecture, and then I will try to elaborate on the homework help. So make sure that you look at that homework help um, as you're going through the assignments. So what we've learned in the past is that if we have a normal curve and if we knew what the mean was, so let's pretend we have some data and the mean is 50. And then if we knew that the standard deviation, let's say was um, 10, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna write the mean is 50 and the standard deviation is 10. Then you could label this, right? So this one standard deviation away from the mean would be 60, 70, 80, and on this side, it would be 40, 30, 20. So these are the actual um, units used for whatever this experiment represented. But when we put it on the normal curve, we could switch to the standard deviation units. In other words, this is one standard deviation, two, three, this is negative one because it's to the left of the mean, negative two, negative three, which means right at the mean, you would be zero standard deviations away from the mean. When we use these numbers, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, these are called z-scores. So if the book or someone else re refers to z-scores, they're referring to how many standard deviations away from the mean something was. So for the first half of this homework assignment, they're basically going to set up these story problems where um, you're trying to compare two different things. So one reason it's, it's convenient to switch to a z-score is because instead of needing two different pictures, you could plot both on the same picture if they are in terms of just the z-score numbers. So I'm looking at question number three in question number three, the trick is to recognize that they're giving you two different things and you need to organize your data compared to the two different things. The way you read it, it's super confusing. They just jumble everything together. So you want to separate that data out. Mine says, suppose baby's born after a gestation period of 32 to 35 weeks. So that's one category, 32 to 35 week gestation period babies have a mean weight of 2,800. So they just gave me the mean for this group of babies and a standard deviation of 600. So standard deviation of 600. While babies born after a gestation period of 40 weeks, so this is greater than 40, right? Um, greater than 40. Um, have a mean weight of 3,000. So X is three, X bar is 3,000 and a standard deviation of 435. Okay. Um, then they say if a 34 week gestation period baby, well that baby would be in here because it's 34 weeks, weighs 3250. So this is the actual baby. So it's just an X weighs 3250. And a 41 week gestation period, that means the baby would be from this category, weighs 3450. Find the corresponding z scores and which baby weighs more relative to the gestation period. Okay, so I could just do a chart for this, right? And put 2800 as my mean and then 600 for each standard deviation away. Then this would be a separate picture. 3,000 is my mean, 435 for each standard deviation. But if I convert them to z-scores, then I can place them both on the same chart, and then I could tell who was bigger or smaller um, relative to how far away they were from zero, basically. So the way we do this is we use this formula, z equals x minus x bar all over the standard deviation. This formula is in your formula sheet, so you don't have to memorize it, um, but you should practice it. So in this case, I have 3250 
minus 2,800 divided by 600. So that ends up being 450 over 600, which reduces to 0.75. So this is their z-score. For this baby, I have um, z equals 3450 minus 3000 all over 435. So that would be 450 over 435. So their z-score is 1.03. Okay, so these are the two different groups. So now I have them both converted to z-score. So I could plot them on this picture and see who's the furthest away. So this one is 0.75. So I'm gonna be somewhere around here, right? And the other one is 1.03, which puts me somewhere around here. So the question was, which baby weighs more relative to the gestation period? So the one furthest away in the more side, right? If they'd been talking about less, it would have been further away to the left. But further away in the more direction is that one. So then you fill out your answer appropriately. Okay, so the next few questions are going to work that way. Um, I'm going to now jump to question nine, where they introduce this concept called a percentile. And you've actually, I'm sure, experienced something that had to do with percentiles in your past. Um, like if you took a standardized test and they'd be like, oh, you know, you scored in the 80th percentile or something like that. So what percentile means, it's different than percentage. So if you scored an 80% on a test, it just means that you got 80% of the questions right, right? So it tells you how you did um, compared to the questions, how many you got right versus how many you got wrong. But if you do an 80th percentile, then you really don't know how many questions you got right or wrong. It just means that you scored better than 80% of the people who took it. I mean, you may have only gotten three questions right, but if you did better than 80% of all the other people who took it, then you score in the 80th percentile. So um, what we can do is we can figure out different things about these percentiles and it gives us some meaning, which is what I'm gonna to get to after I talk about question number nine. So question number nine, we're just doing an interpretation. It says, explain the meaning of the following percentiles in part A and B. A says, the fifth percentile of the weight of males 36 months of age in a certain city is 13 kilograms. So the fifth percentile is 13 kilograms. So what that means is, that 5% of the 36 month old males are gonna weigh 13 kilograms or less and 95% weigh more than 13. So if I had my number line, you know, and here's zero and here's 100. So the fifth percentile is 13 kilograms. It means that 5% Laid what weighed less than 13 kilograms, and that 95% weighed more than 13 kilograms. So you have to choose um, the correct explanation of that. And for most people, they can quickly figure out, oh, okay, that means that 5% or less and 13%, I mean 95% or more. But there are actually two answers that basically say that. The difference between the two is, um, one, just says 5% of males weigh 13 kilograms or less. The other says 5% of 36 month old males weigh 13 kilograms or less. You want to use the one that is more descriptive, that actually uses the same description from the original narrative. So on B, I've got the 95th percentile of the length of newborn females in a certain city is 53.8. 
So we know that we're going to say 95% have a length of 53.8 or less. The question is, do we say 95% um, of newborn females have a length of 53.8% or less? Or do we say 95% of females have a length of 53.8% or less? Um, or 53.8 centimeters or less. We're going to say the one that says newborn females as a compared to just plain old females. Use the one that's the most descriptive. So in this case, if I put it on a chart, um, it was the 95th percentile of the length of newborn females in a certain city is 53.8. So let's say this is the 95th percentile and it's 53.8. That means 95% are less than 53.8, 5% or more and then make sure you use the narrative that has the most description. Okay, so there are a couple of specific percentiles that we use for this other formula. So if I had my number line, um, and here's 0%, and here's 100%, well, 50, 50th percentile is meaningful to us because that's actually the median. So something you need to keep in mind, if you're using StatCrunch and they want you to find the 50th percentile, um, then go to Stat, Summary Stats, and choose Median. It doesn't actually say 50th percentile. Then another one that's important is the 25th percentile and the 75th, only because we like to sort of use, you know, kind of nice rounded places when we talk about things. Think about it as like 25 cents, 50 cents, 75 cents, a dollar. You know, we don't like to really talk about numbers in between. We like to sort of judge them off of these, what we call quartiles. So these are called quartiles because they break the number line into fourths, right? This is one fourth, two fourths, three fourths, four fourths. So we would call this Q1 this is Q2, this is Q3. Um, so quartiles break it into fourths. We could have quintiles, which would break it into fifths. So that would be like um, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. Um, so, and then we could do percentiles, which breaks it into ones, right? So one percentile, two, three, four, five, which is what we were doing down here. So um, what's important about, I'm sorry, what's important about quartiles is that we use quartiles in a formula um, to find outliers. So what's an outlier? It's it's an answer that's kind of extreme. So like if I was doing the ages of all the people in the classroom, you know, and let's say the average age was, I don't know, 31, but then someone walked in who was 95, well, they're gonna probably be an outlier. But how do we mathematically know at what point someone becomes an outlier? An outlier, is it like, is, 80, is 85 an outlier? Is 75 an outlier? Like, where is that cut off? So what we do is we create fences for our data. And if you have something more extreme than the fence on the left or right, then that is an outlier. So to find outliers, we want the lower fence. And then let's say my lower fence was here. Then anything lower than that is an outlier. And we also want the upper fence. So if my upper fence is here, everything to the right is an outlier. And for each set, set of data, it's different because it all depends on your data. So how we find the lower fence is Q1, which is the first quartile, which, by the way, you can find in summary stats. So you can do stat, summary stat, and what are some things that you can find? So stat, summary stat, you can find, let's see, and then columns. Obviously, you can find the mean, the mean, the standard deviation. You can find Q1, Q2, which is median, so you'd have to select median. You can find Q3, and you can find this idea called IQR, which stands for interquartile range. So my formula for the lower fence is Q1 minus 1.5 times IQR, which this is in 
your formula sheet, and the upper fence is Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR. I hope that's on the page. Okay, so you can find Q1 and Q3 and IQR and summary stats, but you cannot find the lower and upper fence. You'd have to plug them into this formula. So um, what is IQR? It's the interquartile range. So let's say your Q1, let me clean this up a little bit. Let's say that your Q1 happened to be um, happened to be 30 and your Q3 happened to be 7,000, you know, depending on, we're obviously not talking about ages anymore. Your IQR, which is your interquartile range, is the range between Q1 and Q3. So in this case, it would be 6,970, right? 7,000 minus 30 is 6,000. 970. So that would be the IQR for this particular set of data. So if I wanted the lower fence, I would do Q1, which is 30, minus 1.5 times 6970. And that would give me my lower cutoff. Anything below that is an outlier. My upper fence would be Q3, which is 7000, plus 1.5 times 6970. And that would give me my upper fence. Anything to the right of that would be an outlier. Okay, so that's kind of everything that um, this section talks about. I know it's quite a bit. Um, starting with the z-score, then we move to percentile. Remember, percentile means it's bigger than everything less than that, right? If I score the 95th percentile, I do better than everyone, the 95% of the people, okay? Um, then we talk about specific percentiles, Q1, Q2, Q3. Remember, Q2 is, a, is the median. The 50th percentile is the median. And we use these often to find our fences by using these formulas. So that's all I got. I'll talk to you next time.